the first place? Yep. Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy day. A nice Friday afternoon. My name is Parker Emerson. I'm the Associate Director at OISS, just down the street. Hopefully a name is familiar to you. Um, my colleague, Erin Gustafson, works with SOM directly. She's in our office, but she, uh, you should know her face, her name. She's been here a couple times already, meeting with students. Um, so as much as I would like to help you with follow-up questions, Erin Gustafson is your person. Um, her contact information is on our website. Um, I think you can appreciate that there are questions we can answer at OISS very quickly, uh, free of charge. Um, because they relate to your student visa, okay? And we, we're happy to entertain questions that go beyond your student visa, but at a certain point when you say um, startup in Rotterdam and new incorporation in Stockholm and working in New Haven, we're like, time out, get the lawyer. Um, so you've got a bifurcated system where we can help you and feel free to start with us. Don't, don't be shy about asking us. But there may be a time when we say, you know you need to speak to an immigration attorney. Um, Ron will, will be able to frame this better, but uh, the reason it needs to go to an attorney is twofold. One, it's not about a Yale visa. Two, it gets super complex super quickly. Um, so it, it, is, it is really all the business schools across the country rely on good relationships with immigration attorneys. Um, I see some of our staff members up here. Could you just say your name so folks know your names and faces? Yeah, hi, I'm Monica Weeks, and I am a student advisor, so if you can't find Eric, it's really just coming to me. Hi, I'm Anthony Hill, I'm an intern in the office. Hi everyone, my name is Georgia, so I'm a working fellow at the office. Hello everyone, I'm Rob. My name is Mike Gibbons, and I'm a scholar advisor. Okay, and without further ado, um, we're thrilled to have Ron Plasco uh, really quite an internationally known attorney, um, nationally known as one of the best immigration law firms, dealing with universities, with startups, um, dealing with investment visas. He's one of the foremost uh, EB-5 specialists in the field of uh, what's called the investment green card. And we're, we're just thrilled he's taking the time to come up here to New Haven to speak to us. So we have about an hour for a presentation until one o'clock. He'll have a little time afterwards to take questions, but we also have his cards here. Everything he's gonna talk about today is already on the OIS website, so I understand we're being recorded, or will be recorded, but also know that the PowerPoint is on the OISS website. Um, he's also doing another session at four o'clock, which is more general for uh, graduate and professional school student kind of visas after graduation. But we're thrilled to have Ron here. Thank you so much, Ron. Welcome. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, my pleasure to be here. Let me tell you what, uh, what I plan on talking about today. And if this doesn't interest you, yeah, I won't be uh, upset if you, if you leave. But we're not going to kind of do a general overview of, of visas. We're going to really focus on startups and entrepreneurs. If you're going to be going to work you know, for Citibank or McKinsey or Goldman Sachs, you, you probably don't need me, and they're going to take care of all your immigration issues. They're going to file for an H-1B for you. They're going to file for a labor certification for you. So we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about those of you who are thinking about an entrepreneurship track, looking at starting a business, um, uh, maybe working for a, a small company that doesn't know much about the green card process or the, or the H-1B process. So we're going to focus on startup H-1Bs and startup, what's called startup E-2s and startup L-1s. Get a little bit at the end into green cards. So that's where we're planning on going. A few things we're not going to get into. Number one, OPT. You've got several experts here on that. They're far more expert than I am on OPT. Number two, tax issues. Um, I know enough to be dangerous. Um, yes, I worked for Arthur Anderson for a short period of time, but I'm not a tax lawyer, I'm not an accountant, uh, and therefore we're not going to talk taxes. Uh, we're not, if, how many of you are from Canada, Mexico, Australia, Singapore, or Chile? A strange grouping of countries, but all of those 
have special visa categories that I'm not going to talk to the group about because it doesn't interest most of you, but you can see me afterwards for specific kinds of visas that you may be eligible for that's not part of today's discussion. So, um, with that said, let's, uh, let's get ourselves started. Um, the first thing we're going to, I'm going to do only one slide on F1s. Um, and the slide on F1s um, is uh, the fact that many of you ask me, I work with a lot, I work with, you know, with you guys, with Wharton, with HBS, with Fuqua, with a number of business schools, and I get a lot of calls, emails on the subject of, while I'm on campus, while I'm studying, I'm interested in starting up a business. Can I do it while I'm on an F1? Um, and the answer is, yeah, up to a point. So, what you can't do as an F1 is employment. You, other than 20 hours a week on campus, something related to the campus, other than that, you can't be involved in employment. Well, the issue is at what point does starting up a business constitute employment? So in my opinion, and it's hard to find stuff on this, because there is no immigration rule on this. Believe it or not, there's no definition of employment in the immigration laws. Shocking. And, and that's why I have that article on the website, Murky F1 Employment Issues, that gets involved in some of this. But here's where I see it. You can get involved in everything relating to a startup while you're, on, while you're an F1. You can incorporate a business. You can talk to lawyers about corporate issues and tax issues. You can talk to bank about financing issues. Um, you probably can even get involved in looking for people who might want to work for the business. But once you have your startup started up, and now you're ready for, to have something done that's going to generate revenue, it's at that point that you can't be the one doing the service that's going to generate the revenue. You have to hire somebody to do that. It's perfectly fine for your startup to have an employee who's doing stuff that's resulting in your company making money and that money going to you. There's nothing that says you can't make money as an F1. You can have stock in Intel and other people working for Intel making money and your stock's going up in value and you're cashing out. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, your business is not exactly Intel, but it's the same concept. You can own a company that's making money as long as you're not doing service. So I wanted to talk about that. Other than that, we're not going to talk about F1s. So we're going to talk about where we are in 2014. And, and this kind of changes at different times. I, I've been here up at Yale for a whole lot of years. And those years go you know, included and were before the 2008s and the 2009s when we had all sorts of different stories to tell. You know, there weren't jobs available. It was different issues. Today, there's generally a lot of job offers, and there's good news and bad news attached to that. You know, the good news is you're getting a job, and you probably have a choice of jobs, and that's a wonderful thing. The bad news is that there are quotas for H-1B visas, which are the natural path from your student to, op to <coughs> practical training, OPT, to H-1B. Now, these quotas are ridiculously small. We're going to take a look at it, but it's not enough for everybody. There's special quotas for people with US master's degrees. And up until 2014, that was enough. The bachelor's folks lost out, but there were enough for masters. In 2014, for the first time, there weren't enough for masters. And something like 80% or so of you guys were able to get the H-1B visa, and the others couldn't. And unfortunately, that number is going to stay the same. The demand is going to increase. And therefore, we expect that every year, the percentage of US master's degree candidates who are going to be able to get H-1Bs, whether it's a startup or whether it's McKinsey, the percentage is going to keep going down. So that's part of what we need to talk about in 2014. Well, what is the attitude of the government toward entrepreneurs? And it's, it's very mixed, because if, I can cite you to all sorts of speeches that Obama has given, 
and that the director of USCIS has given, and the director of DHS has given, about how important entrepreneurship is and foreign nationals contributing to the economy by starting businesses, and it's wonderful stuff. And, and they have on the USCIS.gov website, there's something called Entrepreneurs in Residence, which say all sorts of great stuff and you should read it. The problem is that in reality, when it gets down to filing cases, the people looking at the cases are just way more comfortable with a Goldman Sachs that has thousands of employees and formal job descriptions than they are with a startup that they're, you know, is this a real business? You know, is this going to succeed? And it's much more complicated. So that's really one of where we want to do our focus. And by the way, as we talk about this, what are the chances that the law is going to change and these problems are going to be solved? Anybody follow Washington lately? Probably extremely small. So unfortunately, if I'm invited back to campus next year, everything I'm talking about is going to be about the same. So um, just a couple of minutes on H-1Bs generally, and then we're going to focus on entrepreneurs and startups. But what's an H-1B? So that's a visa sponsored by the employer um, for people who have an educational background and a, a, taking a job that requires the educational background that you have. The employer has to pay you the normal wage paid to an American called the prevailing wage. The H-1B is good for, for three years and can be extended to a maximum of six years. And hopefully during those six years, you have time to do the green card process. Uh, you can't start, you, you can do it while you're on OPT. Uh, you, uh, once you have your first H-1B, if you switch jobs, a new employer has to file for a new H-1B because the employer, the, the H-1B is not issued to you, it's issued to your employer. But once you have your first H-1B, two wonderful things happen. Number one is all future changes of employers, you can start working for the new employer before, as soon as they file the application. You don't have to wait for the approval. That makes you more desirable in the marketplace. Number two, once you are counted against the quota for the first time, you never have to worry about it again. That's a big deal. If I want to hire you right now, it's in my mind that I may have less than an 80% chance that I'm going to get you. All right? That's an issue. But you know, once you have your first H-1B, if you're switching from that company to me, then I know there's no quota problem. So two things that are real important to know. Um, the, the way the H-1B quota works is you must file on April 1st of, uh, of the year. So if you're going to graduate in, in, in May of 15, then you're likely to get OPT through the summer of 2016. And then on April 1st of 2016, you'll be applying for the H-1B visa. Now, the government fiscal year starts on October 1 and ends on September 30. The next time there will be H-1B numbers available is October 1, 2015. So when you're applying in 16, you're applying on April 1 of 2016 to start work on October 1, 2016. You, can't, you, don't, you won't have a master's degree on April 1 of 2015. However, you do have a bachelor's degree. It may be possible for you to have two bites at the apple if your job, if your employer says, well, you know, we'd really like you to have a master's, but we're, you know, we're happy to employ you if you have a bachelor's in something relevant plus a bunch of coursework at a master's level. So if you meet the requirements of the job based on your bachelor's degree on April 1, 2015, you can apply then. And then if you don't get it, you get a second shot in 2016. So that's some of the issues that you need to be aware of with H-1B quotas. This has not been a problem up until 2014. It's a huge problem going forward for entrepreneurs and for Goldman Sachs employees alike. So H-1B for startups. There are two messages I want to deliver to you. Number one, this is complicated. Number two, 
it's possible to do it. But if, if you're going to work for Bain, you know, they can do this in a day. You know, you can, you know, the, not a problem. It's all standard stuff. With a startup, I'd say it's a good three month process. So I always tell people, you know, first of the year, not much later than that, see me if you're hoping to file on April 1. Um, and as we go through this, you'll see why there's a bunch of stuff we need to deal with that we wouldn't need to deal with with an established employer. So we need a US employer. So you need to incorporate a business. It can be an LLC, it can be a C, it, can be, it doesn't matter. It needs to be incorporated, a business. And the business, you may own 100%, you may own a 50%, no matter what percent you own, the business, of course, we know this is separate from you. However, for an H-1B, you need to be an employee. Well, that's okay. Even though you own the company, there's nothing that prevents you from getting a W-2 and being an employee of a company that you own. Up until several years ago, the Immigration Service understood and agreed that the corporation is different from you. And therefore, there's not a problem with the company employing you as an employee. Several years ago, they decided to make it more challenging. And they came up with this concept that doesn't make a lot of sense, but that we still have to deal with it, that says that in order to do an H-1B, the company needs to control you. You can't control the company. And basically that the company has to be in a position to hire or fire you, even though you own it, and even though they encourage entrepreneurship. Doesn't fit very well, but we have to deal with it. So how do we deal with it? Um, generally, when we're going to be doing this, we're going to be talking to you and maybe to your corporate lawyer about some structuring issues. We're going to want a board of directors that you're not a majority of. You know, maybe your brother's on it, maybe your best friend's on it. That's okay, but it's not just you. Sometimes we're going to want to set up an employment committee. And the employment committee is authorized by the company to hire and fire people, including you. Be careful who you put on it. But the employment committee has the authority, and therefore the company controls you. You don't control the company. So that the first level we deal with is some structuring issues to try to meet that requirement. There's a question? Yeah. Uh, board of directors has to be Americans or? Does not have to be Americans. Does not have to be Americans, right. Yeah, it really doesn't matter who's on the board. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Okay, so uh, we deal with that first. Now, the next thing we need to deal with, we talked about the fact that the H-1B has a prevailing wage requirement. Um, and the prevailing wage, the concept is the normal wage paid to an American to do the kind of job you're doing. All right. Um, well, if, if, you're, you know, if you're an investment banker, we, there's lots of surveys of investment bankers, not an issue. Well, what are you? Well, at one level, we could say, even though it's your own company, you're kind of the CEO. Well, yeah, but if you're the CEO, then we have to be paid a CEO salary. And if you look, look at wage surveys, you have to be paid 800000 or something. And probably your startup isn't going to be paying you 800000 So what we have to do, and you're not really a CEO. You're not spending your time supervising the CFO, who's supervising the staff of accountants. Who, you know, that's what CEOs do, right? What you're really doing is some function. Maybe it's a market research function at the early stages of the startup. Maybe it's a financial analysis function. But what are you really doing from a functional point of view? And then that's the job we describe. We're not hiding the fact that you own the company. But the job you're doing, we describe it. And maybe if it's a marketing position, maybe the prevailing wages is, is, is 100000 All right, well, you know, then we may be able to deal with that. But even if the prevailing wage is 100000 then the question is, well, where's the money coming from to pay the salary? And the answer shouldn't be that, you know, to start up my company, I drew a check for 100000 to the company, and now it's going to go into this pocket because I'm going to take it out as salary. So we want to show some independent source of capitalization of the company to be able to pay your salary. 
Now, it could be revenues. Maybe the company is already making money. Great. It could be angels or, or venture capitalists. Fine. Kind of could be mom. Nothing wrong with that. I'd prefer something else, but we can deal with that. Something other than you. All right, so that's a key issue. So these, we're going through all the kinds of issues that we deal with, because we do a lot of these startup H-1Bs, and these are the issues we deal with, and these take some time to, to do. Um, we need to show there's a real job. You know, just giving the, the immigration service saying, here, look, here's a piece of paper that shows this is a company. You know, we, we all know we can, have, we can form 30 companies today if we want to. It doesn't mean anything, it's paper. So the question is, can we show this is a real company doing real business and therefore there's a real job for you to do? And the key to that is a business plan, a really good business plan done by you or done by a professional business plan writer and, and geared to immigration issues that I'll be able to discuss with you. But the end result is trying to convince the immigration service you know, we, it's, we're not Goldman Sachs. We can't point you to revenues and net income and, 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 and organization charts and all that stuff, but we're real. And, and so the business plan is going to explain that, and it's going to include financial pro formas, maybe one, three, five years. Uh, guarantees, no, but projections, yeah, yeah. And hopefully it's going to make our business credible, uh, and therefore we're, they're going to be satisfied that there's a real company, and then we're going to describe the job. Well, the job, I mean, technically, if you're, you know, if this is a startup, you're doing everything. You're answering the phones, you're, you know, you're emptying the trash, right? So, but we need to describe a functional job. And a lot of times the immigration service is going to challenge whether what you're doing as a startup, where you're doing everything, is what's called a specialty occupation whether that requires a specific degree to do. And the way we generally deal with that is we're going to give you homework, and we're going to ask you to take every course you took in your MBA program, and to the extent, if, you, if there's anything at all that you learned in that course that you, that you could apply the principles on the job with your startup, we're going to ask you to write a paragraph about that course and what you learned there and how it could apply to what you're going to do with your business. And that's how we're going to explain to the immigration service that, yeah, this really is a job that really requires an MBA to do, because that's a critical issue to what we're doing. So these are some of the issues that we deal with. How many, anybody interested in search funds? Maybe we'll talk about that separately. Search funds raise different issues. It's basically all the complications we just talked about and then some. And we've done some of these, we've done them successfully, but that's something separate because most people aren't interested in that. All right, now, H-1B may be our first choice. For some people, there's going to be other visa categories that actually fit better, the E or the L being the most likely, so we want to talk about that. We also want to talk about the other visa categories because you may lose the H-1B lottery. And then you have to have a fallback position. So for those two reasons, we want to focus a little bit about what are the other options for our startup company. One of those options is the e-visa. Well, what's the e-visa? It is, it is a visa based on treaties, bilateral investment treaties, treaties, what's called treaties of friendship, commerce, and navigation between the US and many countries, but by no means all countries. So the first thing we need to figure out is, we go to that website to find out, does our country have a treaty that allows the E? If it doesn't, then we move on to other options. If it does, then we need to know what, how this works. And the, the first issue is, in order to be a company under the treaty, the company has to be owned at least 50% either by you or by other nationals of your country at least 50% nationals of your country. Um, this is a, a good visa category because unlike the H-1B, which has a six-year limit, there's no limit. You can have it forever, as long as the business is going. Number two, unlike the H-1B, uh, which, which has a quota, there's no quota. Number three, unlike the H-1B, where your spouse can't work, 
With the e-visa, your spouse can work. Um, so there's you know, a lot of reasons why we might be interested in this. So how does it work? Well, there's something called E1 and E2. E1, we're not going to spend time on, because it's not most of you. And E1 is for import-export companies. If you're, if you're doing a, a lot of import or export between the United States and your country, we talk about E1. But for most of you, we would be talking about E2, which is treaty investor. And the concept of a treaty investor is a business owned at least 50% or more by nationals of your country where you or other nationals of your country have invested a substantial amount of money to create a business in the United States that's going to be a viable, profitable, ongoing business. So how much is substantial is the obvious question. And the answer is fairly surprising, which is there's no answer to in terms of a dollar amount. We're going to talk about green cards based on investment a little bit later, called EB-5, which Parker mentioned. And we're going to see with EB-5 green cards, I can give you exact amounts. You have to invest at least 500000 You have to create at least 10 jobs for US workers. OK? Pretty simple, straightforward. With E2, no black, no white, all gray. How does it work? So let's use two examples, because I get asked this a lot. You know, I, well, I could possibly invest 100000 OK? Is that substantial? Maybe. It depends where you're investing. Two examples. One possibility is you're, you want to start a, a consulting company. You already have people who are interested in using your consulting services. Um, all right. How much money do you need to invest to do that? Well, you need you know, maybe a desk this size, a computer, a telephone, you know, maybe a plant in the corner. Not a lot, right? 100000 may be more than enough especially if you have clients, to show that you're going to be able to create a successful business with $100,000. We're going to have a really good business plan. All startups, we need really good business plans. It's going to show how we're going to use this money, how it's more than enough, how we're going to make a lot of money based on this. Uh, maybe we're going to employ some people. Example two, your lifelong dream is to establish an automobile manufacturing company. Is $100,000 a substantial investment? Clearly not. There's no way you can even make a dent in establishing a successful manufacturing company based on a $100,000 investment. So what we're trying to do is show that whatever amount you're investing for this type of business is sufficient to be able to establish a successful business, make money, more than just enough money to pay your salary, and hopefully employ people. Although there's no specific amount of employees that you need to have, if you do have some employees and if the business plan credibly shows that you're going to have more employees with your projections, you may have a good E2 case. There were questions, yeah. Yes, then you lose your E status. So I don't care if the ownership changes as long as the end result is 50% is owned by nationals of your country. If that's not going to happen, you lose your E, and we have to look at other options real quickly. Yeah? Can you raise funds on the status? Can you, I'm sorry, what was that? Raise funds, you don't allow? Yes, you, you, and in my opinion, again, there's nothing on this subject on, on for F1s. In my opinion, there is nothing wrong with raising money on an F-1 because that's not employment. Okay? If you want to create a placement fee. If you want to do what? Create a placement fee. Then it gets a, then I'm, then I'm less comfortable. Yeah, and, and this is, there's, there's nothing I can cite you to on any of this stuff. Okay? In my view of how the immigration service thinks, it's, am I doing a service that is generating revenue? Um, all right, so uh, now, for an E2, you can be the investor. If, if the money is coming out of your pocket, then you are an E2 investor, and that's fine. If the money is coming out, if, if, you're, if your father has a business, uh, in, uh, in, in Germany, 
and your father is going to be investing the money to start up this business, that's fine. Company is owned by you or your father, nationals of the country, we're fine there. The investment was made by German nationals, that's fine, doesn't have to be you. And then you can be the manager of the treaty investor company, and that's perfectly fine on ED2. You can be the investor or you can be the manager. It's also possible that uh, using Germany that uh, you're, uh, you're going to go to work for Deutsche Bank. All right, Deutsche Bank is a German company that has invested a lot of money in, in the U.S., obviously, uh, and as such is, is, is classified as a treaty investor company. It's a German company that's made a substantial investment in the U.S. If they want to employ you not as a manager, but as a key person, something called an essential skill employee, they can employ you on an E-2 visa. So there's different ways that we can do the E-2. Yeah? Who, who owns the company? The company that is maintained by employees. Yeah, well, we, we need to prove that 50% or more of the, if you're Swiss, yeah. we need to prove that 50% or more of the equity of the ownership is Swiss nationals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if, if the owner, it's, it's fine to raise the money, all right? So once you've made the investment. Are you, are you going about common stock ownership or like preferred stock? Common stock. Common stock, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, so 50% of equity has to be divided into what? Only one, right? No, the, the, well, the 50%, I'm not sure what you mean by that. All I care about, it, the 50% can come from 10 people as long as they're all one person, as long as they're all nationals of that country. Okay, so that's another option, the E2. May work for some of us. Another startup option is the L1 visa. And this is an option that is sometimes even an option if I'm going to go to work for Goldman Sachs. May end up being better than the H1B. So how does this work? First of all, the, the, the concept of this, and, and you know, as this slide says, this is not limited to any country. It's not treaty. It can be any country in the world. Again, no quota, you know, better than H-1B for that. Uh, is there a limit? Yeah, it's limited to seven years for managers and five years for others. Um, if it's a startup business, you get one year, and then you can go from there, and you have to show you've done some business in the first year. Um, and your spouse can work. Again, that can be a big issue for some of us. And again, the spouse can't work on the H-1B. So how does this work? The concept of this is we have a company that has offices in the U.S. and overseas. Um, we can set up a brand new U.S. office. We can have existing offices. The, the foreign company can own the U.S. company. U.S. company can own the foreign company. You can own both companies, brother, sister, affiliates. But we have to show, again, at least 50% ownership in common between the U.S. company and the foreign company. That's the precondition. Okay? All right. Now, once we've done that, then the next issue is you have to have worked outside of the U.S. for that company for at least one year. One of the last three years. And then the company is transferring you from the overseas office to the U.S. office to work here. And you can do this for managers, and you can do this for what's called specialized knowledge employees, people with very key skills. Now, lately, you know, the Immigration Service at different times is more liberal or tighter on different things. For whatever reason right now, they're really tough on who's a manager and who's a specialized knowledge employee. So they're very comfortable with the concept that you are, and this is again the, the, you know, the, the, the comfort level with a bigger company as opposed to the smaller company. They're very comfortable with, you know, you're here on the org chart, and under you there's five people here, and under them there's 22 people here, and you're managing those people or managing those people. They're very comfortable with that. 
There, but that's not all the managers under the law. There's functional managers and project managers and product managers, people who don't supervise anybody are still managers when you read the regulations. So the only problem is it takes some convincing of the government to explain that. Um, so you know you don't need a whole cadre of people under you uh, if you're managing a function or if you have uh, managing a project where it's all independent contractors. It's doable. So uh, we have to be a manager and executive. We have to be a, or a specialized knowledge employee. Um, so now we're doing a startup. How does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that doesn't meet the requirement that you have to have spent one year outside of the U.S. managing the company. It's not a question of managing people outside of the U.S. It's a question of you being outside of the U.S. doing the managing. Yeah, but, but let's say I was managing people outside the U.S. before, and now you're going to come to the U.S. and continue to manage people outside of the U.S.? That may be okay. That may be okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So... Um, so now, you know, I, this, is, this is not Deutsche Bank, you know, with, with you know, offices overseas and offices in the U.S. and all this stuff. This is a startup. We're going to now, you know, I, I, I did, a, you know, before I, you know, came to Yale, you know, I kind of started my own business overseas. Uh, and now I'm, you know, now that I've got my, my master's degree, I want to start a business in the U.S. That's fine, but it has challenges, just like the startup H or the startup E. Well, what are the issues? Number one is we, we need a place of business. All right? We need a lease, a commercial lease. Um, we need a, yeah, we don't need any specific number of employees, but the immigration service is very uncomfortable with whether you can really be a manager of a business where you're the business. All right? So I can't tell you you must have X number of employees, but I can tell you if you have some, we're going to have an easier shot at it. Unlike the E, this, the L1's not based on investment or capitalization, but we're trying to paint a picture here. Right? It has to make sense. If there's only $10,000 behind this business, there may be questions about how real it is. So some reasonable amount of capitalization of the business. Um, again, business plan, financial projections, absolutely critical. So. We could decide that, you know, this makes some sense. You know, maybe, you know, before I came to Yale, I was employed by Goldman Sachs in England. Um, can I do an L1 now if Goldman Sachs wants to employ me after my master's degree? The answer is maybe. My answer is yes. The immigration service, again, not that comfortable. They kind of conceive of it as L1, if you're going directly from Goldman Sachs there to Goldman Sachs here, and here you're going from student to that. Under the law, you can do it. Very often, when I'm advising you guys, I'm, I'm talking about what I call the path of least resistance. You know, uh, it's not good enough for me to say, this is fine, if the government is going to battle me on it. So wh what I'm telling you is, they're more comfortable maybe in that situation uh, with, with, with Goldman Sachs doing an H-1B for you. So that may be our first choice with the L-1 as a backup because they may question whether you can be an L-1 if you've been a student for two years. But under the law, in my opinion, you can. <clears throat> now, what if you lose the H-1B lottery? Goldman Sachs applies for you, you lose. Well, even though you weren't planning on it, the L-1 becomes a really good option because Goldman Sachs says, look, we can't employ you here but we'll be happy to employ you in London. And then after one year, either we can apply in the H-1B lottery again, or at the end of one year, transfer you as an L-1. Okay, not so bad. So that becomes a strategy. There happens to be a big advantage for L-1s when you go to apply for a green card if you were a manager outside of the U.S. We're going to see that the typical, the, the, there's no great green card option for the entrepreneur. We'll see why in a few minutes. However, if you are a manager outside of the U.S. and a manager in the U.S. for a related company, there's something called multinational manager, where not only can you get an L-1 visa, but you may be able to get a green card 
if you were a manager there and you're going to be a manager here. And it's going to get rid of the other problems that we might have in getting a green card that we're going to look at. So, pretty important to know about L1 also. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there is, but that's different from how the Immigration Service applies for it. When you look at it, it says manager of people or manager of function, not in these exact words, or manager of function or manager of project or manager of product, or, right? I mean, there's a lot of options, all right? But, I mean, I remember once being, I, I do a lot of, of speaking where the government people are on the same panel. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember, you know, the issue came up uh, where someone asked the government, well, do you agree that, you know, that there are functional managers and things? And, and they said, oh, yeah, we certainly agree with that, as long as they're managing a lot of people. Well, that's not what the law is. But, again, it's important to know how they think and then deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the answer, the, the, the specific answer is, it's okay, it doesn't kind of break the continuity of the one year, but we really should be able to show that, you know, when you put maybe it's one year and three months with three months in the U.S., but it doesn't count toward the one year. Yeah. So, I'm uh, just going to spend a, a minute on O-1 visas, because this is not most of you, but it's just good to know it exists. Uh, and the concept of this is extraordinary ability. So, some of you, may, you know, maybe before you came for your master's degree here, you started a business. Uh, maybe you sold the business, made a lot of money. Uh, maybe it was written up in your country's newspapers or online or our country's newspapers or whatever. Or for whatever reason, you've developed a reputation before you got here. People know about you. You're an entrepreneur. You're a really successful entrepreneur. Well, if that's the case, we're going to want to at least look at O1 and see if we think you qualify as being, as having some recognition beyond Yale, beyond your hometown, of being a top person in something. Okay? So it's out there. It's called O1. In, in the rest of our time, we're going to talk about green cards. And as complicated as it is for the entrepreneur uh, when we're talking about visas, it's not necessarily more complicated, but the, there's very few options. All right? Because, yeah. Oh, sorry. Before I'd rather do that separately because almost nobody cares about TN1s. So I'll be happy to do that afterwards. Okay. Sure. Uh, TN1 is for Canada and Mexico. Um, so, uh, when we're talking about green cards, the traditional way of doing a green card, why is it skipping? Um, the tradition, <laughs> it's haunted. Um, it doesn't want me to do that slide. The traditional way of doing, see, I told you it's complicated. Um, the traditional way of, of doing a green card when you go to work, you know, for, for Bain or McKinsey or whatever, is something called a labor certification application. And they have their policies on when they'll do this. You know, it's involved, but it doesn't worry you because it's done by the company. And basically what happens is the company advertises your position and has to show that uh, they've attempted to find somebody with the skill set that you have that qualifies for you for the position, um, and they've advertised online in the newspapers, and they have not been able to find a qualified U.S. worker. And if the U.S. Labor Department agrees, then they issue something called a labor certification to McKinsey that says, uh, we agree, dear McKinsey, we agree that you're, this guy is not taking a job from a U.S. worker. And based on that, you can go forward and apply for a green card. Okay? So, can you do that with your startup? And the answer is, in almost every case, no. All right? I talked about workarounds for, you know, the way they deal with stuff, and we had workarounds to be able to do H-1Bs and L-1s and E's and all that stuff. 
There's no good workaround on the green card because the Labor Department takes the position that if you own the company, or even if you own 50% of the company, that that company cannot in good faith advertise a job to replace you. That they're not going to allow US workers to be used as pawns, you know, thinking that they're applying for a job when realistically there's zero chance that you're going to replace yourself with an American. Whether you agree with that or disagree with that, it's, very, it's, it's somewhere between difficult and impossible to get around that in a company that you own a substantial percentage of. Well, that's a problem. Because what other ways are there to get a green card? Well, let, no, I'll try to go back, but um, family, employment, investment, asylum, lottery. Well, we'll talk about family and we'll talk about asylum and lottery real quickly. Um, family member, if you're going to marry a US citizen, may be a wonderful thing, may not, but for a green card, it's great. Because you are able to get a green card usually in six to nine months, uh, and usually a work document in two to three months, a travel document in two to three months, and everything's great. Any other family category is likely not to be a good option for you. Why? Because of green card quotas. Green card quotas are different than H-1B quotas. They're country specific. And basically, in the family category, for every country in the world, there are long waiting lists in all the family categories other than marriage to a US citizen. Some of the waiting lists can be as long as 20 to 25 years. Okay, So it's ridiculous. Now, some of them are less. I mean, if you marry a green card holder, it might be you know, three, four, five years. Each category is different, but there's long waiting lists. So family, unless we're marrying a US citizen, probably not an option. Uh, asylum, I'm afraid of going back to my country because I fear I'd be persecuted. Um, OK, if you have that situation, you ought to sit down with an immigration lawyer. Let's talk about it. You know, if you've got a good case, it may lead to a work document and eventually to a green card. The green card lottery, wonderful thing. Go to travel.state.gov to see if your country is, is included in the lottery. If it is, you apply. If you win, you can get a green card. Should you plan your life around it? Probably not, probably not. Um, but in all seriousness, it's OK to apply. Just have a backup plan. Or that's the backup plan, and have a front plan. Um, so we've talked about family. We've talked about the green card lottery. We've talked about asylum. And we've talked about the traditional employment category. So what's left? What's left is green card through investment, which is, for better or for worse, often the only real option for the entrepreneur. So we need to understand how this works. And you remember what I talked about. And by the way, we have a separate website on that, eb5immigration.com. So this is very different than the E2, right? We said with well, the E2, no exact amount of employees, no exact amount of investment. For the green card, it's exact. Um, you need to invest either 500,000 or a million. And it's based on geographical area. But the bottom line is, in 90% in, in of the cases, it's going to be 500,000. And if, you know, if you're interested, we'd look at your location. We'd be able to figure out how much. But in most cases, it's 500000 Now, there are two ways to do this EB-5. One way is in your investing in your own business. And another way is basically investing in someone else's business. So let's see how they both work. Investing in your own business. Fairly straightforward. Now, I'm obviously, as I talk about this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking something that involves a lot of money and that involves a lot of rules and trying to compress it into five minutes. So, you know, obviously there's more to it than what I'm saying, but I'll give you a pretty good idea of it. And if you're interested, we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. We do free consultations to Yale students. Uh, we can talk about this. But here's how it basically works. If you invest, let's say, 500000 in a business that you're starting or in another business, um, and if that business if it's a new business, we'll employ 10 full-time US workers. Or if it's an existing business, we'll employ 10 more US workers than are employed now. 
That can lead to a green card. Okay? Um, it's, it's, this is not immediate. It's a process that's usually going to take 18 months or so, 18 to 24 months. So you need some planning for this. All right, that's one way to do it. What's the problem with that? You know, most startup businesses don't start up with 10 full-time U.S. workers. All right, so that can be a problem. But maybe over time, maybe if we're an e-visa, after three or four years, we're going to have 10 workers. That's okay. The inve we could have made the investment years ago. That's okay. And then we're on an E for a few years, and now we're ready to do an EB-5. Okay. The other way, which happens to be the large majority of EB-5s, is people making investments in something called regional center projects. Now, this is interesting stuff. Basically, what happens is the, the U.S. government, USCIS, um, takes applications from cities, states, private developers, uh, and as, you know, some of the biggest real estate developers in the country are now using EB-5 as part of their capital stack. Uh, and a lot of this has really just happened in the last few years. EB-5 has existed since 1990, but really become a big deal since about 08 and 09. Uh, you know, started when there was no other, there was no bank financing, but it's, it's spiraling and for the first time we're going to have EB-5 quota backlogs because there's too many applicants, but that will only apply to China, nobody else. So, um, I'm, a, I'm a private real estate developer, the, the, the state of Vermont, the whole state's a regional center, the state of Michigan, regional center, the city of Miami, regional center. But mostly private developers. I'm a real estate developer. I want to be, I'm going to be building a bunch of hotels in, in, in Connecticut, uh, and I want to use EB-5 in the capital stack. I file papers with the Immigration Service saying, here's our plans. Please approve me as a regional center, and then I can have foreign nationals invest in my projects. My projects are going to create jobs. That's the whole key to EB-5, job creation. Uh, and the Immigration Service says, yes, you're a regional center. I now am going to be building a Marriott hotel down the street. Um, I want to, you know, I want to have uh, 50 million dollars of EB-5 money in the capital stack. That's 100 foreign nationals at 500,000 apiece, and you may be one of those 100. All right. Does that mean you're working for Marriott? No. Does that mean you have to live in Connecticut? No. You can live in California. You can work wherever you want. You're just an investor. Uh, and this is all going to be successful. I mean, let's assume everything's done right. There's a lot of rules. But the key is, did the Marriott get built? And were the projected jobs created? So you, there's two issues you're going to be dealing with. Number one, you need an immigration lawyer to do immigration due diligence on this. What are the chances that if you do this investment, it's going to lead to a successful green card? And by the way, the green card you get with EB-5 is good for two years. And at the end of the two years, you have to show, you know, it's based on the fact that I'm investing in this, and this is going to be built. At the end of the two years, the question is, was it built? And were the, the projected jobs, often construction jobs, actually happen? Okay? Uh, and if the answer is yes, then hopefully I'm going to get my money back, and I've got my green card. That's the concept of a regional center EB-5. All right, so if one of those two, and, and I mentioned there's immigration due diligence, also very important, there's financial due diligence, because you shouldn't count on the immigration lawyer to advise you, is this a good investment? What are the chances I'll get my money back? What's the rate of return? Will this thing go bankrupt? And that you need, either if you trust yourself, or you know, your financial advisor, your accountant, somebody, to do the financial analysis, which is completely different. I mean, it could be that you end up getting the green card but lose your money, um, and that's no good either. So you're hoping to get your money back with some rate of return and then get your green card. Uh, the, the EB-5 rule is that the, the, uh, the investment cannot be guaranteed. It has to be an at-risk investment. But there, you know, at risk doesn't mean ridiculously risky, okay? And there are some situations, you may be investing with a regional center that's done 50 successful projects already, where everybody's gotten their money back in their green cards. That doesn't mean the 51st is going to be successful, but it tells you something. So, but you do have to look at this stuff very carefully. Now, when we're doing this, we need to show 
that your money is clean, that you, you have to prove what's called the lawful source of the funds. Very often when we're dealing with students, the source of funds is mom and dad, and that's fine. The money can be gifted. In that case, we don't care so much about you, we care about mom and dad, because we have to show how mom and dad legally made the money. It's not just showing it, well, the money was in a bank account and here it is. How did it get to the bank account? How did they make it? In some countries, that's easy, right? If you're in, in England, we may get your tax returns. But more often than not, you know, you're in Asia or you're in the Middle East or somewhere where it's not so simple. And it's not a document-rich society. And we have to go through some stuff to show how you legally made the money and how it shows up on pieces of paper. Um, you can be employed in the business, but you don't have to. You can live where the business is, but you don't have to. You can own 1%, 100% of the business, but you don't have to. Lots of flexibility. So um, that's, uh, we've talked, I'm not going to talk a lot. We talked about multinational manager. We talked about the labor certification, which, which is the traditional a uh, big company employing you and, and filing for a labor certification and advertising. Uh, so I think we've really covered what I wanted to cover within the hour we had. So questions, yeah. Yeah, for the uh, 500,000 investor or million investment uh, for yourself, um, yeah. in addition to creating jobs, can that investment come out of equity? Can you demonstrate your company has a $100 million valuation and you own X percentage of it, therefore that is my investment, or does it have to be like cash out for cash? Yes. The answer, the answer to the first part is no, the answer to the second part is yes. So we can't just say, you know, I invested 10,000, but this wonderful business is now worth a million, so therefore I've invested a million. No, I've invested 10,000. So what, what, is there any way to deal with this? Well, yeah, I kind of could take out the million. There are tax issues and reasons I don't want to do that where it makes no sense, but if I want to, I could take out the million, now it's in my pocket. Now I think I'm going to invest it back in the business. Well, that may be okay. And yet, yeah. In EB five, so um, not for a while. So and, you know, assuming you're, if your spouse is on an E two or an L one, she can work. If your spouse is on the H four, H one spouse is H four can't work. At what point does EB-5 give your spouse work permission? Um, generally, about a year and a half into the process. Okay, So it, it used to be much shorter. The government processing time has gone from about four months to about 14 months on the EB-5 petitions. Until the EB-5 petition is approved, your spouse can't apply for work authorization. So the way it is today, we hope it's going to get shorter, but the way it is today, it's going to be the better part of a year and a half before your spouse will get work authorization through EB-5. Yeah? Yes, it is possible to apply for as many things as you want at the same time. Multiple visas and multiple green cards, all okay. Um, you can only be on one at a time. Okay, so you can apply for a bunch, you know, I'm going to apply for H, but there's a quote, I don't know if I'll get it, I'm also going to apply for E, I'll see what happens. In the end, you can only go one route. But with a green card, you can apply in five categories if you qualify, and as long as one's approved, you're a winner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It can be, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what often happens, let's, uh, very often you're going to be on OPT, on an F1 with OPT, um, and, and you know, let's, the, the typical situation for you guys is 
Uh, it's, it's, uh, you're going to have OPT starting in the summer of 2015 that's going to go till the summer of 2016. And you're going to apply for an H-1B on April 1, 2016, effective October 1, 2016. Well, then there's a problem. You're on F-1, but it's running out, and your new category doesn't start till October 1. Well, what happens? And the answer is that the government which of course is here to help, uh, says we're going to kind of create a fiction. We're going to say that even though your OPT ran out June 17, 2016, in that situation where you had OPT, the OPT is running out, you have the H-1B approved, that's going to start October 1, we're going to let you continue to work on EP OPT until October 1 <coughs> under something called the cap, <coughs> the cap gap rule. Um, so that's a situation where you're on F1, you're going to be on H1, and you can continue on F1 until the H1's effective. Anybody else? It's all clear? Is yes. Not on an E. The o only people of the same nationality can be employed by that company. But as an E, they can employ them as an H or something else. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you've started up a company, <clears throat> and so, you know, uh, it's hard to say here's what I recommend. We talked about three different ways of doing it. We talked about H-1B, L-1, and E-2. And what we would do is look at your situation and figure out what makes the most sense. In many cases, we're going to recommend doing a startup H-1B, but not in all cases. Yeah? What if your startup is uh, a nonprofit? Yeah. Um, it, it, startup nonprofit, perfectly fine for H-1B, perfectly fine for L-1, uh, can be a problem uh, under the treaty for E-2s. Uh, for EB-5s, um, basically it's okay. So in most cases it's going to be okay as a nonprofit. Um, so I'll do one more as a group and then I'll be available if you need me for individual questions. Yes? For which one? For E1, do you have to be employed? Yeah, employed, yes. yes. You have to have substantial imports or substantial exports, and a majority, you know, 51%, has to be between the U.S. and your country. Thank you for your attention. I hope it was helpful. <laughs>